Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization. Let's tackle a big question. Why do so many bodybuilders, particularly pretty good ones, train to failure? What are we going to talk about today? Well, first of all, what is failure? We've got to define that first. Who trains to failure? Why they train to failure? What are the benefits of training to failure to the extent that there are any? What are the downsides of failure training to the extent that there are downsides? And what's maybe a better way to train than just going to failure or just avoiding failure? Let's figure it out. So first of all, what is failure? In the best sense of a charitable understanding, failure is when you cannot do any more reps concentrically of the movement, like in a bicep curl when your biceps just stop and you come back down, and your technique is still ideal. You're not like stopping like you should have stopped here, but you started jostling your hips a bit and then you who knows if it's failure or not. This is called technical failure. It's when your technique breaks down, you cannot do another rep with good technique, and it's not psycho whole body failure we're talking about. So when we talk about failure for the rest of this video, we're talking about technical failure, the best kind of failure that's the safest and makes the most sense, so on and so forth. Now, who trains to failure? Well, tons of jacked guys train to failure, Tons of jacked girls too. Uh, even a lot of pro bodybuilders train to failure or at least claim that they train to failure. But we find out that when people say train to failure, they can mean a variety of different things. Some claim to train every set to failure. Every working set's failure and some actually do that. Some claim to just or actually just train the last set of every exercise or even session to failure. All the other ones are not exactly to failure. Some claim to train to failure, but in reality, they just stop a set when it gets hard. It's not really ever a very convincing failure. And some actually do train to failure in any one of those respects. They really are pushing it all the way. Some train beyond failure. They do forced reps to eccentric failure, for example. So after you can't curl the bar anymore, your training partner helps you curl it up and you control on the way down and they help you curl it up. And when you can no longer control on the way down, then you're done, right? And here's the thing. If so many jacked people train to failure, or at least flirt with the idea, it's at least worth a consideration for us sciencey folks uh, to maybe think, is there something behind that that's a good idea that we can look into? Maybe. Now, here is sort of trying to answer the questions of why people actually train to failure, it's a central question of this presentation. Probably four reasons, as far as I can tell, why a lot of folks train to failure. Number one is it works, okay? Failure training guarantees that each set is very stimulative. If you're training to failure, you're for sure training as far as set to set to set goes, very hard, hard enough, you're good to go. So if you're way outside of failure, you could be doing everything else right, but still sucking, because you're just not training very hard. But if you're training to failure, you know, yeah, you're off to a pretty good start. Number two, failure training fits psychologically in a couple of ways. Super high testosterone males who are predominate the lifting culture and who everyone looks up to, they love to go all out, right? That's just a part of what being male and being juiced up is all about. I don't even mean juiced up just steroids wise, just, just having lots of natural high test. You just want to do stuff like run into brick walls and all the stupidest shit in the world and all the most impressive shit in the world has been done by males with lots of testosterone. It's just something that happens. So when you get a testosterone fueled male and you're like, do this exercise and do your best, they're just going to go to failure. Okay. Another thing is psychologically stopping short of failure kind of seems like quitting on yourself. All right. So if someone says like, okay, two reps in reserve is good enough, it doesn't really feel good enough. It doesn't feel good unless you've done it all. And to that end, there's something cathartic, something therapeutic about really giving it your all and going through crazy amount of pain and not your brain stopping you, but your body being like, I can't take this anymore. That's kind of like a, a like a, a man versus, uh, you know, man versus nature kind of victory there. And it feels good, right? In that sort of milieu, there's a cultural reinforcement there. And it's point number three. Tons of the biggest guys seem to go to failure to some extent. So most others follow along because they want to be like the big guys. Like if you see the big guy doing anything, you're like, well, it's probably why he's big. Never mind the fact that how many years they spent training, what their genetics are, and if they're using drugs is really the three biggest, but all the details do matter to some extent. And that is worth looking at bigger guys and be like, what are they doing? When almost all of them train a failure, at least on occasion, it's going to leave the rest of us thinking, oh man, maybe that's what I should do. And because it fits psychologically so well and because it works pretty well, that's kind of a no brainer why a ton of people train to failure at the very top of bodybuilding and all the way through the ranks. L lastly, oh, sorry. Uh, and then another thing on cultural reinforcement, because it's tough and 
because it's a challenge, any reason that you give yourself or other people, especially for not training to failure, makes you suspected for being a wuss. You know, you say, well, on a technical level, failure training might not in in increase hypertrophy as much. People just shut up. You're just trying to run away from hard work. And I totally appreciate that view because some of those people really are trying to run away from hard work. So if you're trained to failure, there's no questions about your manliness. There's no question about your commitment. It's got all these other benefits. You, you know, you're, you're off to a real good start. And lastly, it's fucking simple, okay? There's no need to estimate effort. There's no need to planning three RIR, two RIR. What the hell is even the difference between those two? You just give it your all, let the chips fall where they may. It's great, right? It has really, really good benefits, right? And that's a lot of the reason why people train to failure because it works psychologically. It fits, especially the demographic that mostly does it. There's a big cultural reinforcement of, you know, if you're really serious, you're going to train to failure. And it's super simple. So a lot of people just do that, right? Now, some of those things are definite benefits. So let's talk about the distinct benefits of failure training. It does have distinct benefits. Number one, it guarantees that each set doesn't leave gains on the table, okay? You're definitely going to exert yourself to a maximum extent. Even if you're feeling down, you know, reaching failures, everything, you're not going to give up. So, for example, if you're saying, oh, I need three reps in reserve today, but you're feeling like kind of like crap, that might really be six reps in reserve. But if you need to go to failure, even if you feel like crap, maybe that's three reps in reserve in reality, but that's already really close to failure and gets you all the benefits. So it's a really, really great sort of bottom mark for working really hard. Number two, it standardizes the stimulus and fatigue magnitude. You know when each set is to failure, three sets equals three sets of stimulus and three sets of fatigue, so you can scale them. And if you take away a set or if you add a set, you know how much stimulus and fatigue you're altering. So for example, if last week you did 10 sets and they were all to failure, and you got a certain amount of stimulus and fatigue and you want to know, you want to do a little bit more, you just add a certain number of sets to failure, you know you're getting a proportional increase in the fatigue. If you did three reps in reserve last week and then this week's two reps in reserve, how many sets do you add? But when each set is going to be harder, it gets really complicated, right? So the standardization, really, really good benefit. Next, another great benefit allows really easy progress tracking. Okay, if you did 10 reps of 200 pounds last month to failure, and this month you did 12 reps, you definitely made progress. You don't have to discount for RIR. You're like, well, 200 pounds, I did 10 reps for three RIR. This month I did 12, but that's two RIR. Like, did I really lose a rep or gain a rep? What happened? If you go all out, you know exactly where your watermark is, plain and simple. It's just kind of like in other sports, you know how good a team or individual really is when they're matched to someone they have to use all their abilities. Like you see someone's a really good wrestler, put them up against the state champ. You're going to find out exactly how good of a wrestler they are, uh, especially if they lose, but like by how much. You think someone's really a stud, they go up against the state champ, they lose 10 to 8. Right? That guy's really good, man. That's top three in the state, right? But if you think they're a stud and they go up against the champ and they get pinned in 30 seconds, ah, you know, that push to failure, it really exposed some weaknesses, right? Where if you think someone's a stud, but they're wrestling four RIR wrestlers all the time, they could be just demolishing people. But if the people you're wrestling sucks, then you never can quite tell. So similar analogy. Number four, in very advanced folks, hypothetically, training to failure may eke out some small gains that short of failure training just can't do by providing a really superlative stimulus, like the real exclamation mark. Maybe. Certainly worth a consideration, right? Especially worth a consideration because a lot of the failure training proponents are very, very elite bodybuilders that may no longer be growing well from anything but their absolute best effort. Something to think about. Now, downsides of failure training. There are a few. Number one, the research just hasn't been kind to it. Uh, the hypothesis that training to failure is better than not training to failure is not a new hypothesis. It's been around for a while. It's been tested a lot now. They've basically found that in beginners, three reps in reserve training is essentially equivalent in hypertrophy to going to failure. Uh, oh boy. Okay. So, but people say, now hold on a second. Beginners don't know how to train to real failure, and they think they're refuting that point. What they're actually doing is making that point stronger. So what you're saying is this. Beginners think they're going three RIR, they're really six RIR. But we have the data to show that people that you now claim, and let's say we accept your claim, beginners really are training a six RIR. And when they think they're failing, they're training three RIR. So six and three reps in reserve in beginners is the same hypertrophy gain. Holy crap then what the hell hope is there if six and three RR are worlds apart? Six RR is barely training. Three RR is now challenging. If six and three RR in beginners gets you the same gains, that 
what the hell does, uh, do you really think zero RIR is going to show some kind of big difference? Of course not, right? O almost certainly not. Same idea is if you look at studies only in intermediates, truly three RIR and one RIR doesn't seem to make a difference in intermediates. So it looks like failure just really isn't needed for anyone, but maybe the advanced. Okay, used to people say like training to failure is better than training not to failure. And then the beginner studies came out and they're like, but not in beginners, just an intermediate advanced. And then the intermediate studies came out and they're like, well, maybe just an advanced, right? It's not overly compelling anymore, right? And who knows? They might do some research on advanced and show it's not even necessarily advanced, which is why I say maybe, we just don't know. Bigger problem, number two. The stimulus to fatigue ratio of failure training is not ideal, okay? Failure training stimulates as much, maybe let's say even a little bit more growth than near failure training that's not all the way to failure, okay? But it contributes way, way more fatigue, way more fatigue, mostly from psychological uh, effects like RPE. Like when you go to failure, it's way harder for you perceptively than not going to failure and it taxes your system altogether. Huge, huge difference, right? So two sets at two reps in reserve, two whole sets, might cause the same fatigue as just one set of true failure as far as systemic fatigue is concerned. But two sets at two RIR probably grow like 1.3 to 1.5 times the amount of muscle or stimulate the amount of muscle growth as just one set of training to failure. How the hell is that worth it, right? So you got the same fatigue from two sets as one set, but at the same time, you have way more muscle growth. It just seems better to train shy of failure instead of failure. There are exceptions to that, but this is definitely something that's going to leave you thinking for a while and not just be like, okay, failure training all the time. Lastly, in beginners, it leads to technique breakdown. When beginners go to failure, their technique breaks down very often and it leads to injury risk stuff and your poor stimulus to fatigue ratio, no longer hitting the muscle you want. So really, really bad news. And it's almost certainly not worth in beginners, okay? A lot of times people say, beginners don't know how to go to failure. Like, That's true. And they say, they have to learn. No, they don't. <laughs> they can just go really shy of failure and get amazing gains and ingrain their technique a ton. When they become intermediates, they can learn how to go to failure because that's maybe when it's necessary. And we don't even know if it ever even is, right? In advanced lifters, going all the way to failure, we're not sure, but it might create some instability that may increase acute injury risk. Maybe. Another maybe, but definitely not a good maybe. It's something worth considering, right? If an advanced lifter is told, hey, here's a challenging weight for you that you've only ever hit for 12 reps, hit it for us for nine reps, what is your assessment that you'll get hurt on this set, let's say, of incline barbell press? They could say, you know, like nine reps out of the 12, I think I should be fine. But if you tell the same advanced lifter, you know, lifters have their, their wisdom. I say, okay, I want you to do as many reps as possible. Now, you, have a, you have great spotters, but I want you to go all out and get 12 reps or more. Now, what is your probability of injury? They're going to be like, uh, <laughs> it's low. It's very low, but yeah, it's not zero. And it's not something I'm maybe super comfortable with doing all the time. Makes sense, right? When you have lifting competitions, even for reps and strongmen, people tend to get hurt more often in competitions than they get hurt anywhere else. And a lot of times that's maybe because they're pushing to failure, even for reps. Now, Taking all this into consideration, it looks like we have a little conundrum here because failure has a lot of things going for it, but it also has some pretty interesting detractions. I think there's a better way. The third way, that's a reference to uh, actually to fascist politics in uh, 1930s Germany. How about that for, for an off-color reference? So here's the deal. Maybe a better way to train is this. Failure training has its merits, especially in setting a really high bar for stimulus to know we're really, really doing a good job and letting us track progress super easily. Granted, okay, we believe it. But it has downsides too. You don't need to train to failure to get really, really good gains unless you're maybe really advanced. And it carries tons of fatigue better spent elsewhere. So what can we do that's better? We can start our mezzo at anywhere between two and four reps in reserve. For beginners, more like four, three-ish for intermediates, two for advanced, because it gets tougher as you go. As you start your meso, you do all your sets and reps and, and weights, and you write all that down. And then the next week, you try to add a few pounds or a rep or two each week. And then the next week, you try to add a little bit more. For example, you squatted 200 pounds for sets of 10. Next week, 202.5. Next week, 205. Next week, 207.5. Still sets of 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, all the way through. Or you're doing push-ups and you did a set of 18 and then a set of 16 in the first week. Next time you do 19 and 17, then 20 and 18 and so on and so on. So you keep 
increasing the load and or reps every single time. Set increases happen for other volume reasons we've covered in other videos, so we just leave that alone. If we're talking about within each set, you increase and increase and increase and increase just by little increments. Because you started at, let's say, 3 RIR, one of two things happen. As you increase your reps and load, either you will get infinitely strong forever. That would be sweet. That's actually the preferred option. I could call this the plan to get infinitely strong forever, and it would be huge false advertisement. Or eventually, as you keep adding by small increments, you get closer and closer to failure, and eventually you hit failure. And once you've hit failure, you're probably really close to your MRV. You won't be able to increase the stimulus anymore because you'll start to get temporarily weaker. You deload, drop the fatigue, start at three or four RIR again, but with a little bit more weight than last mesocycle, a few more reps, so on and so forth, and you start that push again. This way, we get the awesome benefits of reps in reserve training, but we only have to estimate RIR once at the beginning. And it's okay if what you thought was three was really four, what you thought was three was really two, no big deal, because those little tiny increments of increase every single week are gonna take care of everything and just naturally direct you to eventually making training harder and going all the way to failure. So this way, we get all the benefits of training shy of failure, and we get the progressive overload of going closer to failure, and we get the benefits every now and again at the tail end of our accumulation phases of actually going to failure, maybe even beyond for advanced lifters, and providing that huge stamp, that exclamation mark, that superlative stimulus. We're covering all the bases, and we're essentially, instead of having to choose from two buffets, the dessert buffet of failure and the regular tasty Chinese buffet of RIR training, we're just taking a plate and we're taking out of RIR training what we need and out of dessert what we need. I should have been wrong. You don't want to mix dessert and uh, Chinese food on the same plate unless you're a fucking animal like me. You just mix it all together and eat it. Folks, that's all I have for today. Gives us some thought. Train to failure or don't. See if I care.